I want to wish all of you a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us from around the world. And thank you, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time for this informational webinar for Columbia Business School Executive Education's upcoming online program, Value Investing, Making Intelligent Investment Decisions. We are so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. So before we get into all the details, we go module by module, and Nielsen tells you all about this incredible, amazing uh, program offered through Columbia Business School. The simple answer is, why come to value investing online? And who is this program built for? If you're on this call today, we are pretty sure that this program is built for you, that you are someone who is interested in value investing. You are someone uh, who wants a leg up in your investing, whether it is as a side hustle, as a hobby, as a career switch, as your profession, that you are coming here to Columbia Business School because you want to be one of the best when it comes to value investing. But this course is especially built for you if you are an individual investor or a portfolio manager. So if you want to discover the value investing methodology, if you want to learn how to look beyond the market wisdom, or if you want to know how to uncover opportunities that others miss, then this course is for you. Or if you are a corporate decision maker and you want to be able to enhance your analytical skills, you want to learn when growth creates value, or you want to be able to identify valuable competitive advantages, then this program is for you. So we feel that you will gain a lot out of this course and there's no one better in the world to tell you about this course and its amazing opportunities and what you will learn in it than our incredible program leader, Securities Analyst at First Foundation Incorporated, Nielsen Fields is on the line with us today. And Nielsen will be taking us through module by module, telling us all about value investing, where it came from, also why Columbia is such an amazing school to be learning value investing at. So it is my pleasure to have a Nielsen with us here today. So Nielsen, take it away, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Appreciate the time that everybody's sharing with us this morning or in the evening or afternoon, but just quickly a background on myself. So I grew up in Denver, <clears throat> Colorado, and went to Colorado State, but that is where I caught the investing bug. I read the Warren Buffett way, which was recommended by one of my finance professors and absolutely fell in love with the concept of investing your money to watch it grow. Some people collect cars, some people collect houses, some people collect stamps, but I think I collect businesses in an investment portfolio and that's where I like to spend my time. <laughs> so it really is a hobby for me, which is great because I don't really feel like I come to work every day. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, after undergrad, I went to work for a hedge fund in uh, Southern California for eight years and then went to Columbia Business School because I wanted to be a better investor made my way back to Southern California and now at First Foundation. Started as a securities analyst. I should probably update my profile. I'm a portfolio manager now, so I manage a portfolio of 30, I think, high-quality growth-oriented businesses. But if we turn to the next slide, this is Warren Buffett's track record since he became public. And so Mark was asking why value investing earlier, why this course might fit for you. But the Bottom line, if you will, is that if you can outperform the market, first of all, market returns are pretty attractive over the long term. It's between seven and 10%. So every seven or 10 years, you're doubling your money in the stock market. But if you do a bit better than that, things can really compound at a high rate of return. So Warren Buffett's track record here since he took over Berkshire Hathaway turned $100 into $2.4 million uh, in, I think, 2017 is the last year we have that. So versus 16000 in the S&P 500. So you can see the power of compounding. He more than doubled the, in terms of annual rate of return, the market, but that is far more in terms of doubling your money at the end of the period. So that's the, the goal, right? We're not saying after this course, you can be have a track record of 20% compounded annual return. That's a Hall of Fame return, but you can see where 
the interest is to building wealth longer term. Next slide. I went to Columbia Business School. That's the picture on, this is the Columbia campus, actually, the picture on the left here. The, the newest version or campus that we have for the business school was the first picture that you saw when you came on to the webcast. But that's also where Warren Buffett went. And he went there in the 1950s to study under the gentleman uh, on the right here. And his name is Benjamin Graham. And he's thought to be the founding father of fundamental analysis. So he wrote a book coming out of the Great Depression called Security Analysis. And this is often thought as of the Bible for security analysis. And basically, he all of investing, investing, if you will, prior to this book was just focused on tips from friends. But his book analyzed the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows to judge whether or not a security was a good investment or not. And he actually defined investing and speculation differently. So most investing at the time actually was speculation, not rooted in any fundamental metric at all, but investing in his view and in my view is rooted in fundamental analysis and I think this course really gives you a good foundation of fundamental analysis to build upon. Next slide. So the professor today at Columbia Business School carrying the value investing torch is Tano Santos. And he's the faculty director and head of research of the Helbrand Center for Graham and Dodd Investing. So Graham and Dodd, by the way, wrote security analysis together. They were both professors at Columbia Business School. And so it's the Graham and Dodd, the Helbrand Center for Graham and Dodd Investing is like a permanent seat for value investing at Columbia Business School. There was a period of time, I think in the 80s, maybe early 90s, where the Chicago School of Business was really driving the narrative on investing and efficient market theory and value investing didn't totally die out, but it was a lost art, if you will. I feel like it's the Jedi. And so this is a permanent seat now. And so Tano Santos is the head there. He co-taught value investing with Bruce Greenwald while I was there. And Bruce Greenwald was the professor there for probably 15 or 20 years. And so Tano had the privilege of working with Bruce Greenwald and now is the professor at Columbia Business School teaching value investing and your professor for this course. Next slide. So our learning journey for this course, should you choose to join us on this journey, starts at the top here with the foundations of what value investing is. And then the next piece, the valuation is really the, I would say, heart of our work that we do throughout the course. And we have three valuation methodologies, which I'll touch on in a second. But the meat of the course is really focused on valuation because you want to know what a business is worth when you're making an investment. Because if you don't know what it's worth, how would you know if you invest in it or not? The third piece here is then tying in strategic analysis. And this is actually my favorite module because it's mostly qualitative work that we're doing instead of quantitative. And, and the, quantum, the quantitative side seems to be getting more and more efficient as computing power continues to rise and this firm is called quant shops or hedge funds called quant shops literally use big data sets to search for opportunities and once those opportunities are found there's arbitraged out and so your advantage there is waning but on the qualitative side that is still untapped in my view and very few people actually incorporate strategic analysis into their valuation. And you can't do valuation work without understanding the strategic aspects of the business. The, what is it, fourth piece here is valuing growth. And that is something different that we view growth much different than the general market. Not all growth creates value. And so therefore not all growth is created equally and we show you what growth creates value and how to think about valuing a business that grows. And it's completely different than 
your traditional discounted cash flow model or Gordon growth models. We think it's a unique view and lens on that aspect. And then finally, risk management, how do you pull it all together in terms of just the macro risk, uh, overlapping portfolio risks, how to hedge those potential risks out that you're unintentionally exposed to and how do you net out those risks? And then we tie it off with the capstone class on John Deere, which is many times folks' favorite module, but that is the learning journey that we're going through. And so on the next page, I'll just talk about the valuation sort of foundation that we have. Three valuation methodologies here. AV stands for asset value, EPV stands for earnings power value, and FV stands for franchise value. And that last piece is that you want to try to buy a business with a margin of safety uh, where the market value is below, say, earnings power value or franchise value, and maybe even asset value. But asset value is just the dollar amount required to recreate a business. So we use Walmart as an example. And the idea is to estimate uh, the dollar amount that we'd have to spend to recreate the Walmart franchise. And that is your asset value. We have here free entry or no competitive advantage. So any business, think about it as the ability to get into business and recreate that. What's the dollar value? Okay, there's also uh, on the earnings power value, every business has a level of earnings power or earnings or profit that they're generating. And uh, we compare sort of the value or the all the future cash flows of that business discounted to today of their current earnings power, and then compare that value to the asset value. And there's a strong signal um, when comparing the two. And if if it's a free entry, no competitive advantage industry or business, then earnings power value should equate to asset value uh, because basically you're only earning your cost of capital. But if there is a difference where earnings power value is uh, coming in above your asset value, that means that there should be some sort of competitive advantage. And then you wanna analyze what that advantage is. You wanna analyze how long or durable you think that advantage is in order to sustain sort of that excess level of earnings power. And then finally on franchise value, a business with a competitive advantage perhaps might have some growth opportunities. And so how do you value that growth? And actually we think about it in returns rather than a dollar point estimate of value our sort of distribution yield or the amount of money being returned to us as shareholders, plus then the return generated from reinvested capital into the business. You have to estimate what that reinvested reinvestment rate is. You have to estimate what the return on that reinvestment is to ultimately stack up these sources of returns in franchise value. Uh, and then you wanna compare all of that to what the market value is and whether or not you have a, we call it a margin of safety, which simply means if you think that the earnings power value of the business is $100, you don't want to buy that business necessarily at $100. You want to have, work in a margin of safety, i.e. protecting against error when you buy that business. So maybe it's $70 versus $100 of fair value. So that I think is the fundamental framework that everything else hangs on in our class. And this would be the meat of the class with the other modules fitting in here to tie it all together. Next slide. And so just I'll walk you through um, a brief overview of each module here, but the first module would be the value investing framework and then starting on asset value. But the main piece is that psychologically value investing or investing in general is hard, right? And this last point here, most importantly, value investing requires discipline and humility, coming to terms with one's psychological flaws and a constant process of review. I think Ben Graham had said, you're, you are your own worst enemy in investing. 
And that's because the psychological impact of what goes on in the market, whether or not stocks are going up or down, can affect your behavior. And oftentimes, we're wired as human beings to act almost the opposite of what you should be doing to generate attractive returns in the stock market. Because when everybody's selling, it feels best to be selling. But really, that's where the opportunity is, and you should be buying. And the opposite is true as well. When everything is rosy, you probably should be taking off risk instead of adding risk. So that's, I think, one of the big challenges of investing is coming to terms with your own psychological shortcomings. Next slide. So module two, then we go into further some more asset uh, valuation, but then we also add in earnings power value. And this case study is unique because it has both within it. So there's a hidden asset in this business. There is an activist investor who enters and he can or does unlock the value there, but also they have this earning business. So it's like land and then a business that actually earns money. And so we're valuing both in, in this uh, module. Next slide. And then here is that strategic analysis module. And we talk about the sort of set of competitive advantages that exist. And everybody has a different list. This is Tano's list here. I don't think it, this slide is necessarily exhaustive, but uh, some good examples here. There's also a really good book called The Seven Powers that outlines their view of what they call power, but that's competitive advantage as well. And you'll see later that we do host live office hours and I host this live office hour and it's by far my favorite office hour to host. Next slide. We value Magna case, and I was talking about earlier, the fact that you have to, what is the term, jib when others are driving, basically going against the crowd. But this is Magna International, which is the case study we have in module four, and they are a tier one auto supplier. So you can see here that uh, light cars, car and light truck sales just took an absolute nosedive in 2008 and nine. And that is when we're looking at this case study. Was that a good investment at the time? And so we were doing work when everybody else was running for the hills because of this chart here. But that was really what provided the opportunity in those shares. Next slide. Okay, so then we get into value and growth. And this is just uh, basically a replication of the slide that I touched on uh, earlier. Um, so I won't spend much time on that, but this is just further outlining how we value growth. Next slide. Module six is the Amazon case study. And I think Tano has a very different view of what Amazon retail is. It, it's crazy to <laughs> that the... Uh, Amazon has changed even I'd say in the last five years so dramatically that the viewpoint on Amazon, specifically the retail space, is that it's the best e-commerce business out there. But I think you have to question whether or not e-commerce is actually a good business. Had Amazon just stayed within e-commerce and hadn't started AWS or advertising, I think it would be a destined to be a low margin business to eternity, but that's a very different view of what the popular opinion of Amazon is. So we look into why that is. And then Leo Cruz, I think, does a really good job in his office hour of talking about Amazon and the embedded expectations in the stock when he posts his office hour. Next slide. Okay, and then we talked about risk management. I touched on this earlier, but the first most broadest risk management is just uh, the market and the economy. We're monitoring what's going on with interest rates. And since December 31st of this year, inflation started to heat up, which meant that the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates, which meant that 
valuations were coming down because the basis for all valuation is the risk-free rate, which is the 10-year U.S. Treasury rate. And if that's rising, then valuations are falling. And so that's just something to be aware of. And you don't necessarily have to act upon that. And maybe it's providing opportunities today. But I think it's uh, worth having in your mind, at least as in terms of like the general landscape that you're operating in. And then more closely to you would be the portfolio that you're putting together position sizing. And that's very much a personal choice. Somebody's 20% position in the stock or 10% position in the stock could be something that they can sleep with. But for somebody else with a different mentality, that would be much too large. And so I think when you're going through this, if you can be using real money to put together a small portfolio and watching yourself and how you react to different things will help you determine your position sizing. And then there are risks that you're taking that might be unintentional. So for deer, you're taking on the commodity price risk of corn. And if you don't want to do that, how do you hedge that risk out? And so we talk about that. And then specifically at the stock level, using a margin of safety that I talked about before, extending your investment horizon, because the longer you extend your investment horizon, the more important the fundamentals of the business become versus in the short term, the sentiment of the market. And Ben Graham has a quote that says, you know, in the short term, the market is a voting machine, meaning a popularity contest. And the long term it is a weighing machine, meaning fundamentals drive the stock performance. And that's what we care about is the fundamentals driving the stock price. So the longer you extend your time horizon, the more important that becomes. And then this idea or concept of a pre-mortem, and that is to have an investment view on a stock, but also fast forward five years. Um, and write out why that investment turned out incorrect. And that will help you generate negative views on the stock. But if those views are outweighed by the positives that you found, then, then I think it's a good investment. But the pre-mortem really helps you rev up your creative mind about what could go wrong. Because often what happens is you get excited about a stock, you have a confirmation bias, meaning you go out and you find information that that confirms your prior held hypothesis versus finding disconfirming information. And writing a pre-mortem helps you uh, be creative and, and do that. Next slide. So finally, you've got two weeks in this final eighth module, and we talk about deer from A to Z everything that you've learned thus far. And like I said before, I think it's one of our most popular case studies out there. And then just one more slide for me before I turn it over to Mark. Um, we do have additional examples hosted during my live office hours. The first four weeks, we talk about Ball Corporation. And that is a live investment for myself at my firm. And so you can see what my thinking was or what my thinking is uh, as we go through the first four weeks and you get a presentation, you get my Excel file and model and my live thoughts on the idea throughout the first four weeks. And we walk through sort of the concepts that you learned in that module and we apply it to fall at that time. Um, this is just another example of how to, I guess, put into practice what you learned. I do want to mention one more thing before I hand it over to Mark. We do have, we've created a foundational, a foundations webinar in the first week. So this is directly after our introductory webinar. But this module is for those who, I'm sorry, not module, but a webinar is for those who don't have a strong background in investing or accounting. There is a language of investing and we use that language throughout the, the course, 
And we just want to set everybody up for success. And that foundations webinar will go through and talk about those foundational uh, topics that you need to know. So like right here in the middle, you can see this concept of no pattern net operating profit after tax. Some people might not even know what net operating profit is, right? And then the next one there is WAC or the weighted average cost of capital. Some people don't know what the weighted average cost of capital is. So we'll be discussing those things at that foundation's webinar. So if you feel like some of this is a foreign language, it's still, I think, uh, an appropriate class because we try to get you up to speed uh, very quickly on those concepts that you need to have to be uh, ready for the course. Okay, so Mark, let me turn it back over to you. So with that, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how this program will go, what this course will feel like, what your learning experience will be over the next nine weeks of this program. First of all, the first thing I want to draw your attention to, we've already talked a little bit about some of the things that are here in this program highlights slide. We've talked about uh, the John Deere case study, but there are other case studies as well throughout this program. We talked about the, how John Deere is that capstone project. Module eight is the last two weeks of the course. But the first thing that I actually want to focus on is on the top left, this bite-sized learning. Now, what that refers to is that this course, our students invest between six to eight hours per week on this course. And that is the range. That is not an average. So that doesn't mean that some students take three hours and some students take 15 hours. Six to eight hours per week is the range that our students spend on this course. But we understand the entire point of online learning is the ability to be flexible. Because in a traditional academic environment, if you were at an in-person uh, college or university, six to eight hours per week would look like two to three hours about three times a week. That's what it would look like, a three hour long course or lecture three times a week. But the whole point of being able to do online learning is you can make your schedule however you can. So we have broken this down so that every video lecture is five, seven, sometimes even as little as three minutes. So even if you only have a few minutes here and there, you're waiting for a bus, you're sitting on a train, you will be able to complete videos and continue your education no matter what circumstance you're in. Because we understand that everyone's schedule is different. And also after the past two and a half years we've all had where many of us were working remotely and some of you like me were working remotely while having a child learn remotely right next to you. So we understand that everyone's schedules are very different. Many of us are now in some sort of hybrid work environment. So it is inconsistent when we are able to devote time and energy to our educations. So we have broken that down. When we say bite-sized, we mean three, five, seven minutes at a time. Even if that's all you have, you can add up all those five and seven minute opportunities into six to eight hours per week so that no matter where you have an opening in your schedule, you will be able to fit in your education in value investing through Columbia Business School. So like we also said here, real world examples, case studies, application of learning, the whole point of this program is that it's meant to be practically used and immediately applied. So everything you're gonna be learning here is something that is meant to be applied immediately, it, it, whether or not you're an individual investor or a portfolio manager or other on-demand video lectures. Again, that is part of that bite-sized learning, being able to every single week that week's content is released. And so you can watch those videos. Say you have two hours at a time, so you only have five minutes at a time. You can go through it at your own pace. It is cohort-based. So the other people who are going to be learning in your cohort, it will feel like you are part of a classroom. This will not feel like the other people learning alongside you are just coincidentally doing it at the same time. Those online discussion hours, those live office hours that Nielsen talked about that I'll be mentioning again in just a moment, that really will make it feel like there's a classroom and also engaged discussion boards that we have as well. Grading and evaluation, bottom left. Some people might have seen that check mark and they said, oh, I don't know, that looks like tests. I don't like tests. I've never liked tests. Grading and evaluation, I want you to think of it as another support, as another tool of support for you. Because again, we want you to be able to apply this knowledge immediately. We don't want you to feel like we're sending you all this information and all this knowledge through a fire hose and you don't know what you're attaining. We don't want the nine weeks to end and for you to say to yourself, wow, I have no idea if I've kept any of that. I have no idea if I've retained any of that. So we grade you and evaluate you throughout the program, throughout the course, so that you have the confidence to know, oh, okay, I do know this. 
I am retaining this. I am able to apply this because as soon as that nine weeks is over, we want you to be able to apply this immediately in the real world. And those evaluations are there to help you do it. On this next slide, this is an example of what um, these taped live video lectures will look like speaking directly to you. Again, sometimes in just three, five or seven minute long videos, um, just calmly explaining these concepts to you. Very friendly, very engaging. <clears throat> John Deere, we mentioned before those case studies. There are actually eight case studies throughout this program. It is not just John Deere. Some of the other case studies include Walmart, Amazon, Intel, and Nestle. And here we also have an example of one of those evaluations, one of those quizzes like, hey, okay, so we've tested you out. You've learned some of these concepts. Here is an example. Can you apply the concepts you've learned in one of our evaluations? So again, very low stress. Do not, if any of you have any issues with, when it came to testing when you were a kid in the, the high pressure, stressful environment that a lot of our early education experiences involved, that is not what that is. This is just so that you feel confident applying the knowledge and content that you are absorbing, knowing that you've absorbed it, know that you're able to apply it, and so that it will stay with you months and years down the line. So again, we've talked about, Nielsen mentioned his live office hours, but what we also want to mention is these moderated discussion boards that happen every week where you're able to ask and answer questions and share resources. This is one of the most popular parts of this course is these moderated discussion boards where you are all able to connect with each other. Again, this is cohort-based. We do not start off with a chat saying, hey, this is great. Look at our amazing global cohort where we have students from all over the world and then you never see or hear from each other again. The whole point of talking about how amazing it is that we have such an international reach with this course is so that you understand that you're gonna be able to have people from different industries, from different parts of the world, with different perspectives on investing, with a lot of experience, no experience. You're gonna be bringing all of that into these discussion boards and enriching each other's experiences. And those moderated discussion boards are some of the most popular parts of this course. And along with those live office hours where Nielsen will be able to answer your questions, review exercises, go over any extras that anyone wants to go over. The live office hours and the moderated discussion boards are huge perks of this course. We've Mark, received- let me a just comment on that slide before you move on here. <clears throat> of course, uh, let me go back for you. Yeah, thanks. To answer one question, are the sessions recorded? They're all, even the live office hours are recorded, uh, put up online for you to review at your leisure, right? So it really is everything is the, the videos are recordings, and then even the live office hours are recorded. Now, you won't have the chance to ask a, a question live, right, if you're not on the live office hour, but those are recorded for you. And they do happen at this time, so Tuesday mornings for me at 6 a.m., um, and then I think the next four are maybe an hour later, but generally, if you're available during this time, you're going to be able to join the office hour. And then furthermore, on the discussion boards, I think the first two runs, we just had everybody in one discussion board, and it got way too unruly, and so now we segregate or maybe not the right term, but uh, break out the discussion boards into two sort of sets of uh, experience levels. So if you're an intermediate or advanced investor, you're in one set of discussion boards uh, that Leo moderates. And then for beginners to the, the lower intermediate uh, level, you're with me. And, and that way you can feel comfortable asking sort of the dumb questions, if you will, because there aren't advanced investors out there that are participating on the discussion boards and you're not seeing advanced questions that you have no idea what they're asking about. So we think it's very helpful to uh, break out the discussion boards in terms of investment experience. And I think it's very helpful. Okay. Thank you so much, Nielsen. That was enormously beneficial. Thank you so much for chiming in. And again, friends, as one of your program leaders, Nielsen will be the one holding live office hours. And like Nielsen said, moderating one of those two discussion boards. So thank you so much for that, Nielsen. So we also have a lot of great feedback from former participants, but the short version is we've had a lot of great feedback on this program. Uh, you can see that this is on this slide alone, we have 
a managing director, an owner of an investment firm and an investment analysis and investment analyst saying the program helped me understand a new way of viewing investing. The best part was the dialogue between classmates, myself and the program leader. The best part of the course for me was the diversity of cases discussed between the different companies. Again, eight different case studies in this program. We also have very helpfully here a participant profile by industry, because oftentimes people say, I don't work in banking, I don't work in finance. So is this an appropriate course for me? And the answer is yes. As you can see here, 62% of our students, of our past students, do not work in banking and financial services. So if you see this breakdown right here, you can see that once you're outside of banking financial services, which definitely have a plurality, I won't deny that, 38% come from banking financial services. But after that, that remaining 62% come from all sorts of different, all sorts of different industries. You can see here uh, as diverse as tourism, agriculture, IT products, fast moving consumer goods, retail, transport, energy, IT services, consulting, real estate, healthcare, retail. You can see they come from all sorts of different industries. So uh, if you consider that maybe that 38% are likely to be your portfolio managers, and then the other 62% are maybe more likely to be your individual investors or people looking for a career switch, that might be a helpful way to think about it. But the bottom line is, no matter where you are currently in your career, you have been represented by someone in that exact same position in one of our past cohorts. We have a tremendous amount of global diversity with our cohorts. We have a tremendous amount of industrial diversity among our cohorts and also years of experience as well. You're going to have people in your cohort just starting out in their careers, and you'll also have people with 15 or 20 years of experience in their industries as well. So more uh, kind words from former participants. I really like the concise nature of the videos for me as a working professional. It is much easier to keep up with the course materials. I also like the practical application, which provided a grounded way to put the concepts into practice. The simplistic presentation of the materials. It's easy to follow. The material is very practical, not theoretical. The Nestle exercise forced us to understand the brands and how to evaluate and review barriers to entry. Very helpful to have an explanation video following the exercise. So you're feeling supported all along the way. That's what I want you to take from this quote, that you're always feeling supported and we're never just throwing information at you and hoping you retained it. I really liked how the examples brought the course material to life. I feel that I have a firm grasp of the subject matter. And finally, the exercises, although simple in nature, really taught you to think beyond the quantitative nature of evaluating a company and look at qualitative items with great importance. Now, on top of all of this, on top of all of this amazing knowledge and content and all these connections that you will make, upon completion of this program, you will also receive a verified digital certificate of participation from Columbia Business School Executive Education, which you can put on your LinkedIn, you can put on your resume. It is a great boost in your cap. It's a great feather in your cap, I should say. This is something you can bring in interviews, something you can leverage in future opportunities, but also it's a great networking tool. Our past students have put this on their LinkedIn, on their Twitter, and they've been able to connect with previous student, with students in previous cohorts, but also students in future cohorts. You never know who took this course before, and you never know who's going to take this course in the future. And so many of the connections that our previous students have made have been invaluable to them in their present and future careers. And so this certificate is just another tremendous opportunity, just like I said, another boost, another feather in your cap that a lot of our students have found incredibly beneficial. So with that, program support is putting a link up in the chat box that you can click on to register for this program, Value Investing, Making Intelligent Investment Decisions Through Columbia Business School. An incredible opportunity, an incredible investment in your career or like Nielsen said, maybe in your hobby that you want to turn into a career if you're one of those personal investors. And like I said, you'll always love going to work if you work at your hobbies. So please go ahead, click on that link. Do not miss the opportunity to join the next cohort of Value Investing Online, Making Intelligent Investment Decisions. How would you rate the level of instruction in this course? And it's a tricky question because the course is built so that if you're a beginner or intermediate or advanced, this course has something of benefit for you. We can, it's especially with those discussion boards. So no matter where you are in your, yeah. in your value investing career, there's, this is a course for you. Yeah. So I'd say just the pre-recorded videos are intermediate level, but then in the discussion boards and the office hours, it can skew beginner or advanced.
And it's really, if you self-select into that advanced group, then it will be intermediate to advanced because you're asking many more advanced questions on your discussion boards. You're getting feedback from Leo um, and your other students about your advanced question. And then on the beginner side, it really skews the other way. So it's everybody is going to have their own like distinct experience and it depends on where you select your experience to be. So it's, I'd say the general content intermediate, but then it can skew advanced or beginner. But I'd say too, importantly, just participation really drives that. We have some people who <laughs> will get notices that they haven't watched a single video. They're clearly not getting their money's worth, nor are they participating on the live discussion boards during that module week. And so you really miss out on a lot of feedback in your learning process if you're not participating on those discussion boards. So the more participation that you have, I think the more you take out of the course, the more you can drive whether or not you want to have a more advanced experience or a beginner experience, et cetera. I'd just say participate if you're going to join the course. Would this course have a pragmatic use if I use an investment banker to advise me and manage my stock investments? If so, why would this course be useful or what will be the value of taking the course? Yeah, I think so. And the reason is that you'd have a better idea if that investment advisor is good. You can look at performance, but say he's suggesting or she's suggesting XYZ stock, you can have a framework to put that investment uh, choice upon and evaluate for yourself whether or not you think it's a good investment. Perhaps this person will have a different opinion and, and that's totally fine and that's really what makes a market, but now you can have an I'd say an intelligent, informed discussion about whether or not that's the right investment. Thank you, Nielsen. This, so this course will help you turn your meetings with your investment advisor, turns it from a one-way conversation into a two-way conversation. Yeah. So, thank you so much. And how many students are usually in the class? You also mentioned this as a record live class. We also have weekly discussions. What are the hours? Are they all fixed hours? Correct me if I'm wrong. The discussions are more like moderated discussion boards. Those, are, those aren't necessarily right. just like a live meeting where you sit down and brainstorm. Exactly. You can put up a question on a discussion board anytime during the day, any day, and we're moderating those discussion boards ongoing so that it's a live organic um, discussion. So those are... Uh, literally typed questions onto a platform on uh, Emeritus, and we're getting to those as soon as we can. Those are ongoing, no really time or date, but we do encourage you. So every new module week, we move to the next discussion board. And so that discussion board is for that module topic. And so you can view say you're in module five, you can go back and view module one, but really students have moved on to the module five discussion board. And so you really won't have that live interaction if you're going back onto module one, say uh, discussion board, right? Because we're on live discussion on module five. Do we go over the liquidation value? Yeah, so the... Like I talked about before, the first valuation piece is asset value. And really, that's a reproduction value, but you could think about liquidation value in a similar fashion, slightly different, but that would fall into that bucket for sure. Does this course have applications for investing in ETFs versus single stocks only? Yeah. And for those of you that are unaware of what an ETF is, that's like a collection of businesses. So the S&P 500 SPY is the ETF that follows the index that has 500 U.S. domiciled stocks in it. And so our investment analysis focuses on single stocks and so not necessarily helpful for overall ETFs, but more specific on the single stock ideas. That is all the time we have for today. Program support is putting that clickable link back up in the chat box. You can click on to register 
for this course beginning in just about a week and a half or so. So please click on that link. If you have any additional questions at any time, please send them to Columbia at emeritus.org. Again, it's Columbia, C-O-L-U-M-B-I-A at emeritus.org. I want to thank Nielsen Fields so much for his time and his expertise. Thank you for getting up at this awful hour of the morning, Nielsen. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate you. Yes, you're very welcome. Hope to see you all uh, in the course. And also, I want to thank all of you. Thank you, no matter what hour it was, where you joined us from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining us today for this informational webinar. Again, Program Support has put that link up in the chat box so you can register for this program. Keep that tab open. Send any questions you have to Columbia Emeritus.org. And until then, have a beautiful day, everyone. And we can't wait to have you all in the cohort. We'll see you all in the course, everybody. Thank you all so very all right, much. Thank you. Bye-bye now.